Special thanks to Hone for sponsoring this video. Welcome back to the Screen Crush Break Room. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in What If, Episode 2. All right, let's dive into this episode, which sadly features one of the last performances of Chadwick Boseman as T'Challa. I say one of the last because there's a good chance he'll appear in another episode. Still, they left him a very nice tribute and it adds an extra gravitas to this whole episode. We begin on Morag, the same planet where Peter Quill was introduced getting the Power Stone. The Watcher narrates, But in a multiverse of infinite possibility, is your destiny determined by your nature? Or by the nature of your world? essentially saying that T'Challa would always have been a leader and an inspiration no matter where he ended up in life. So last episode, they had fun playing with all the variations, but history basically played out in the same way, with the super soldier stopping the Red Skull and being thrust forward in time. But this episode had a blast with the variations, like when Korath the Pursuer meets T'Challa. Star-Lord. Who? Oh, Star-Lord! I'm a huge fan of your work. T'Challa has actually accomplished everything that Peter Quill said about himself. This is the Star-Lord. Legendary Outlaws. Well, Star-Lord, man. Legendary Outlaw? But this line is new. Steals from the powerful and gives to the powerless. Because T'Challa has defined his career as being a Robin Hood figure who helps people around him. We steal from the rich and give to the poor. Just like that earthling folk hero of yours, right? Robin Leach. Robin Hood. Unlike Peter Quill, who lived most of his life for himself. Uh, Barit. Barit. Look, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I forgot you're here. He also doesn't want Korath to bow. We be bowing? I feel like we should be bowing. I mean, unless we should be kneeling. Neither is necessary. Please. As we saw him do in Infinity War. <clears throat> what are you doing? Uh, we. We don't do that here. And unlike Peter, he didn't give himself the name Star-Lord. He's actually kind of uncomfortable with it. It is not an official title, nor is it one I am comfortable with. And I wasn't sure if T'Challa had powers or not, which would mean that he drank the heart-shaped herb as a child. I'm pretty sure he doesn't, but if you have any thoughts, let me know in the comments. Now we do see his charity toward others when he turns a fight into a training session. But again, but this time faster, harder. Really? I barely moved, hit me. Also showing us how to earn the loyalty of bad guys like Thanos. Also, unlike Peter, T'Challa actually came with help instead of trying to break away from the Ravagers and sell the orb for himself. Some kind of catchphrase. <laughs> I also like that he's even influenced Michael Rooker's Yondu to be a better person. You know as well as I, no treasure is worth as much as the good that can be done with it. Uh, that's my boy. Peter's just some guy who had to learn how to lead, but T'Challa was raised to be a kink. He says, If we still made like the old days, you'd only have half of your teeth. Because in Guardians, Yondu has several false teeth that he never needed in this reality. T'Challa's ship is named the Mandela after South African president and human rights activist Nelson Mandela, apparently a hero of T'Challa's. Funny because Peter named his ship after his school crush, Alyssa Milano, from Who's the Boss. Yeah, there it is. Get my ship. It's the Milano, the orange and blue one over in the corner. The flashback begins in 1988, four years before the flashback at the beginning of Black Panther. You'll remember that T'Chaka sent his brother and Jobu out into the world as a spy because he didn't trust outsiders. Now what's interesting is that in the main reality, we can see how this influenced T'Challa's isolationist stance. All you will find there is destruction and pain. It also explains why T'Chaka thought that they were better off leaving poor little Eric behind rather than poison Wakanda's purity with an outsider. Notice that T'Challa's spear goes right through the city shield. This is because this isn't the force field that we saw in Infinity War. It's the holographic illusion that we first saw in Black Panther. This never gets old. And of course, his abduction is a frame-by-frame -frame recreation of Peter's. Then we find out that it was actually Kraglin, voiced by original actor Sean Gunn, and the fearsome return of... TASER FACE! I like how they explain the mistake, that they picked up a vibranium reading and assumed that it was alien. Well, my home is built on an ancient vibranium meteorite. And so why did Yondu keep T'Challa and never go back after Peter? Because at this point, he had delivered so many kids to Ego for child murder that he was fed up with it and would have kept the next kid no matter who it was. Well, once I figured out what happened to them other kids, I wasn't just gonna hand you over. You said you were gonna eat me. 
that was being funny. Then the best moment of the episode, when they're listing all of his accomplishments. How exactly did you stop Thanos, the mad titan, from decimating half of the universe? Oh, no. I'm a big enough man to admit when I'm wrong. Josh Brolin returns as a babyface version of the mad titan Thanos. It turns out that T'Challa just made the argument that all of us did after watching Infinity War. T'Challa here showed me there was more than one way to reallocate the universe's resources. Sometimes the best weapon in your arsenal is just a good argument. And we actually have a video coming out soon about how T'Challa changed Thanos' mind. Subscribe and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss that one. And their counter-argument... It's still just genocide, big guy. And I'm pretty sure it's efficient. <laughs> ...is echoing Doctor Strange's response in Infinity War. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. Genocide. But clearly, T'Challa found a way to be more reasonable with him. Now, I want to point out that the floor of the club, like the hologram around Wakanda, is hexagons. Not the bees! But seriously, the hexagonal pattern surrounding Wakanda does match the honeycomb technology that ships use when they travel through their hyperjumps, symbolically saying that this spear is like T'Challa heading off into the heavens. One of the reasons this show is so great is because everyone can relate to the premise. Who among us hasn't wondered, what if? What if I got that Daily Show internship? What if Disney actually had a plan for the sequel trilogy? somehow Palpatine returned. Or for a lot of us, what if aging didn't mean declining? Well, I can help you with that last one. I recently learned that men lose one to 2% of their testosterone every year after you turn 30. And this can result in increased belly fat, muscle loss, fatigue, and even depression. But that's where Hone comes in. They're the sponsor of this video. Hone helps you to optimize your hormone levels. Now look, I know that sounds strange. I was wary of the whole process at first too, but that's because I'm not a medical expert, but Hone is. They are a premier men's health clinic who only offer products and treatments prescribed by a physician that you consult with directly. So to do this, they send you a very easy to use sample home assessment so they can measure your biomarkers to gauge your testosterone level. And it comes with these lancets, which are painless, and the whole process is very easy to use. So if you do meet the criteria, they give you three custom treatment options. You can do a topical cream, swallow a pill, or have an injection. Afterwards, you may feel increased focus, increased muscle mass, decreased body fat, and better sleep. So if you would like to use this home assessment test, you can save 25% and get free shipping by clicking the link in the description. Back to the Easter eggs. At the bar, Drax goes on to talk about how T'Challa saved his family from Ronan. You saved my home world from a Kree invasion. All in a day's way. No, it took several days. And we see his trademark honesty. We should take another one. You look terrible. I look great. I'm sure it's fine. No, I insist. It is a truly awful picture of you. I don't know. I am hideous? You are horrifying to look at, yes. And Nebula has gone through some major changes. Apparently, T'Challa appealed to Thanos before he was done experimenting on her because now she's able to grow hair but still has an artificial eye. T'Challa tells her, You know he gardens now. Which we know is always his idea of retirement as we saw in Endgame. T'Challa still wears the tip of his vibranium spear around his neck, just like Peter kept another emblem of home, his Walkman. And just like with Peter, Yondu told him a lie. When I picked you up as a kid, these boys wanted to eat you. They never tasted Terran before. Told me my homeland had been destroyed. My family killed. In both cases, the choice was made out of love. He may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. Now they're after something called the Embers of Genesis, a life-giving force that can end all hunger, which might be how T'Challa convinced Thanos that there was another way to allocate the universe's resources. Don't tell Captain Genocide over here. You must spoil his fun. <laughs> we also find out that the Collector is the galaxy's new crime boss, filling Thanos' power vacuum. But when I went straight, Tavon saw an opening and filled the power vacuum. And this is totally believable. Though they don't talk about it much in the movies, the Collector and his brother, the Grandmaster, are elders of the universe, extremely powerful beings who just happen to have eclectic entertainment tastes. This also ties in with the final episode of Loki. When the camera is rolling through the multiverse, a vision that we broke down in this video, we see this ship, which was later confirmed to be the Collector ship that we saw in Avengers Infinity War. So this could be a glimpse of this reality, where the Collector rules the universe's underworld. I mean, the Collector was pretty ruthless in the movies. He kept people locked in cages and enslaved women. Mr. Treehorn treats objects like women, man. He and Yondu talk about the job in the bowels of the Ravager ship that we saw in Guardians Volume 2. 
and this beam of light shining on T'Challa is almost like the divine light that shines on Jesus in Renaissance paintings, showing that he's the chosen one who can bring peace to the galaxy. The star chart designation of nowhere does match what we saw in Guardians of the Galaxy, don't worry, I checked. And on the planet, we learned that the Black Order are now working for the Collector. I guess they're tougher than we thought because Thanos has a really hard time handling them. But then again, he doesn't have the Power Stone like he did when he beat up the Hulk. In the Collector's Chambers, we see Cosmo, the telepathic cosmonaut dog from the comics and the first Guardians film. I was always bummed that James Gunn never kept him around in the actual movies. This is a Dark Elf, just like we saw in Guardians, and T'Challa has a lengthy conversation with Howard the Duck, who appeared in the Guardians post credit scene. And just like in the movie, he's voiced by Seth Green, and he also appears here in Avengers Endgame. Most people know Howard from his 1980s movie flop. Oh, I just can't resist your intense animal magic. Magnetism. But he was a hugely popular character in the 70s. His book was hilarious and inventive, and his creator, Steve Gerber, is a genius. You should really go back and read that comic. He name drops the Frost Giants and the Cronins, like this guy in Thor the Dark World and Korg and Ragnarok. Take a Louie at the Frost Giants, a hard Ralph at the Cronins. You're gonna see a sign for Elvish literature? Ignore that. Total snooze. He also mentions Elvish writings, and he's probably referring to Alfheim, the realm of the elves in Norse mythology. Now, this is one of the few Norse realms that we haven't seen in the movies. And did you notice that when Howard gets scared, he quacks? Through it. Most of the aliens in cages are kept out of focus, but I thought this guy looked like one of the brood from the comics. When T'Challa enters the hangar, we see a ton of MCU Easter eggs. They are Peter Quill's ship, the Milano. This one looks like a scrapper ship from Ragnarok. The one beyond it resembles the experimental Quinjet and Captain Marvel. At the top of the hangar, there's an X-Wing from Star Wars. Just under that one, one of the Nova Corps Star Blasters from the Climax of Guardians. This is the Grandmaster's party bus. It's my birthday. It's my birthday. Above it is a necrocraft that the Sakarans flew for Ronan and Guardians. Just beneath it is what I think is a Sakaran fighter from Ragnarok. This one could be the Grandmaster ship, the Statesman. And finally, in the corner, we see the quantum ship from Ant Man and the Wasp. So, the Collector has actually extended his reach all the way into the quantum realm. So, I don't think we should read too much into the appearance of one or two Star Wars ships. It's like when E.T. popped up in The Phantom Menace doesn't mean that that movie is in canon with our world, especially since we know that Star Wars does exist in the MCU. Hey guys, you ever seen that really old movie, uh, Empire Strikes Back? More than likely, the Collector is a completionist who wanted a replica of life-size X-Wing. Join me and together, we'll build my new Lego Death Star. Then T'Challa's necklace activates a space version of a Royal Talon fighter from Wakanda. Now this was captured after King T'Chaka reallocated his resources into exploring space to find his son. Now, in the comics, there was actually a terrific run by Ta-Nehisi Coates about an alternate Wakandan galactic empire that is a must read if you're a fan of Black Panther. Now I like that when we see this ship, we immediately hear those iconic Wakandan drums that were all over the Black Panther score. Wakanda. The dummy exhibits inside are wearing the clothing of the Dora Milaje, who must have traveled into space to look for their prince. In his message, T'Chaka says, Until we find you on this plane or the next. Because remember, in their culture, the wealthy people of noble blood go on to exist after death. Not the most equitable system. <laughs> Down with the man! We will not be silent! The Collector is disappointed to meet T'Challa, saying, Are you sure you could not fly or shoot lasers out of your eyes or something? Describing another alien superhero, Superman. When he mentions discussing T'Challa, notice that Ebony Maul kind of slobbers all over himself. Remember, he talked about dissecting Strange in Infinity War. Painful, <laughs> aren't they? They were originally designed for microsurgery. The Collector punches T'Challa with a rocky arm he took from a talkative Cronin. I gotta think he meant Korg. Oh, well, I tried to start a revolution, but didn't print enough pamphlets, so... His weapons case is another treasure trove of Easter eggs. We see Captain America's shield, Mjolnir, which, okay, I don't know how he broke Odin's worthiness spell, unless he captured it before Odin cast the spell in the original Thor. Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. Then on the far end, we see what looks like Ronan's hammer and half of Thanos' helicopter blade sword from Endgame. I didn't catch what any of these other weapons were. If you did, please let me know in the comments or at me on Twitter. He mentions taking this knife from the King of the Dark Elves, that's Malekith from Thor the Dark World. Then he unleashes Hela's helm and Necra's sword from Thor Ragnarok. Side note, in the comics, this sword is an extension of the God of the Symbiotes, like Venom. And this God is attached to Gore the God Killer, who will be played by Christian Bale in Love and Thunder. 
Before Thanos is showed down with his old crew, he shouts out his old title as the Mad Titan. Not crazy. Mad. Thanos' face turn is also taken from the comics. Briefly, after losing the Infinity Gauntlet, he retired to a farm and then joined forces with Adam Warlock. When Yondu shows up, the Guardians of the Galaxy theme plays. Yondu, sweet! And this one... Ain't no way in hell I was gonna leave here without my kid. Sure reminded me of this. He may have been your father, boy, but he wasn't your daddy. At the end, Karina, who also appears in Guardians... I will no longer be your led a revolt against the Collector. Now, it's hard to make out most of the characters, but this one's a Dark Elf, this one's your mom, and that one's a Skrull. It's kind of messed up that they left all these people to die, right? I like that in the Wakandan ship, the pilot chairs are also meditation chairs. When they return to Wakanda, we see Shuri, and Ramonda is wearing her ceremonial headgear. Kraglin is talking about jump points. Jump points are the best. They make your face all scrambly. Which, of course, we saw in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. <laughs> The episode ends with Peter Quill working at the Dairy Queen that we saw in Guardians 2. And you'll remember that this is where Ego planted one of the seeds for the expansion. Actually, I'm just now picking up that he did this when Meredith was pregnant with another one of his seeds, Peter. And then Ego, voiced by Kurt Russell, shows up to claim his son at the end of the episode. So they're all doomed. Well, that's all the Easter eggs that I found. But if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.